debate. I'll be back in a few minutes to check how this is going. Okay, it's recording. Okay, it's recording now, Jose. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, let's start then with the introduction of the speakers and uh, um, then people from the audience will be joining uh, later. So good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, welcome to this parallel session on home care uh, and active and healthy aging. And really the subtitle is how to how to health, how health data and artificial intelligence can contribute. I'm Jose Martinez Lucero from Funca, is a Swedish SME, and we are coordinating the European initiative uh, AP on AHA and I will be the moderator. So today's session is uh, mainly focused on success, different success stories related to health data management and artificial intelligence. Uh, I'm very glad uh, to welcome our speakers, uh, Laya Puyol, Paco Lupiáñez, and Jonathan Gómez, who accepted our invitation to participate in, the, in this session as speakers. Let me very briefly introduce them. Laya Puyol is a lecturer uh, at the International University of Catalonia and also research fellow at the uh, Lisbon Council. Paco Lupiáñez is the dire director of Open Evidence. It's a company specialized in data management, economic studies, big data, and other related aspects. And finally, we have with us Jonathan Gómez, who is the scientific coordinator of Fundesalud from the Extremadura region. We will have uh, the chat available for, for questions. If you have questions, and at the end of the session, we will make. Uh, well, John Switter will be the chat manager and will be making the, the question to the speakers. So I think I will directly pass the floor to Laia Puyol, who will be doing a presentation on overcoming the challenge of health data sharing. So Laia, the floor is yours. Hi, good afternoon to everybody. Let me share my screen and see if it works. One moment. Okay. Um, okay. Can you see it? Yeah? yeah. Okay. So I'm very glad, I mean, to be here today, I mean, with you in the in the conference. I'm gonna share today basically uh, how to overcome the challenges of health data sharing. And I'm going to be focusing mostly on, the, on my research. So basically on R&D and innovation. So research and development and innovation in the health space. So in the drug discovery uh, process. So um, there's been um, uh, acknowledged that there's um, an innovation crisis in the pharma sector. So there's been uh, decreasing productivity mostly. So meaning that it's been never so costly to bring a drug into the uh, into the market, and it has never been like uh, take so much time to do it. So there's increasing costs. So 2.6 billion, more than doubled just a decade ago, and uh, also it's increasing the scientific complexity that the sector needs to deal in order, I mean, to to bring these drugs to the market. So uh, diseases are much more complex, and then this is also due and affects the the productivity that that, that I was that I was mentioning before. Um, yet there's an opportunity. So this, this sector has, um, has uh, been impacted by, you know, by, by, by different uh, things that have happened. So basically the, um, the sequencing of the human genome was a major landmark for biomedical research you know, in 2003. And uh, as you probably know, this meant like uh, data deluge so basically, months of data, biological data, that need to be incorporated uh, by this pharma in order to better understand associations of targets and diseases, then and, and, and that affected this, um, the, the drug discovery process, but also different technological innovations, so progress in bioinformatics, so uh, huge efforts on the bioinformatics, biotech, nanotech, which has revolutionized this drug discovery process, New analytical tools, so basically artificial intelligence and machine learning have been have been increasingly used. I mean, to uh, to treat, to, I mean, uh, the data uh, in order to accelerate and foster um, the the drug discovery process. And in general, this has led to an emergence of even like a new field, so uh, systems biology, who tries to study uh, more in a systemic or holistic way how 
networks of uh, the biological system uh, interacts. And um, okay, so the literature and, and then uh, people talk about, in fact, like a paradigm shift. So basically after the human genome. So these are the trends that I mentioned on time and cost. So more time, more cost. But then how pharma has reacted to this is all, it's interesting. So basically they have focused more and more on early stages of the drug discoveries. So basically understanding better uh, targets. And what is uh, puzzling is that they have tried in order to address this kind of crisis to leverage the collect collectively their skills. So basically in order to incorporate the data, the different analytical tools, so machine learning and all these kind of technologies, they have, uh, they have uh, sought to, um, to, uh, to share the risks and the costs together. So by generating partnerships, collaborations with competitors among them. And this is, for instance, uh, a study of Lesson and Helfman uh, Deloitte, basically. And it shows that the number of early partnerships of pharma has, uh, I mean, has doubled. The number of consortia multiplied by nine in the last decade. Also early stages has doubled. So basically we see something happening in the sector. So there are more partnerships, more collaborations, and there are different type of collaborations that we see before. This is also like a paradigm shift that, that we were that I was mentioning. So there are more partners. So it's usually not like bilateral, but there are like different organizations involved. So different competitors uh, with open structures. So more like governance structures that are more open and where they share. So the asset scientific progression increases also. So what's going on also, and this is from a study that we did for the European Commission on, on, on Open Science. When we look at the repositories, so data repositories, data platforms, I mean, where you can get this biological data, they are huge in life science. So it's in the top comparing to other disciplines. And also mostly they are open, open meaning that uh, anyone can access to this data. So other organizations that have not generated the data can access to such uh, platforms. And then this is the distribution by, by country. So, Data sharing brings an opportunity to the health space. And this is a very interesting, just to put some numbers of what we mean by this opportunity. So this report from uh, for the Vodafone Group in 2018 that estimates that by 2020, uh, 2027, the, the benefits that can be reaped from health data sharing account from 14 billion. So this is quite uh, um, an important amount. And then experts estimated that uh, basically we haven't, the, so below in the graph, you can see we haven't still like grasped uh, the whole benefits. So for, in, for, for instance, uh, regarding horizontal data sharing, horizontal means uh, sharing uh, data between uh, competitors. So uh, between companies in the same um, uh, position in the, in the value chain. Vertical, by the way, means when you share data with your customers or with suppliers. So it's a vertical uh, supply chain. And external, for instance, when a pharma decides to share the data with Google, so with an external uh, you know, company. So basically what this study says and experts estimate is that these benefits of 14 billion so we have only like from horizontal data sharing um, uh, taken 33% for vertical 48 or 20. So basically what this shows is that there's a huge opportunity still that hasn't been um, acquired or adopted so that, that there's a lot to do. Why is that? So basically because there are a lot of barriers, I mean, to data sharing and um, this is also from uh, another study that, uh, that, that we've been doing for, uh, for, for, for the commission on, on, on data sharing. And um, some of the barriers, I mean, are related to technical aspects. So basically uh, making the data uh, in a format that it can be aggregated or reused by others. So we are talking about interoperability problems. So you need to agree on data standards, data specifications, metadata, so basically how the information of this data is going to be provided. And you need to agree so that everybody adopts this kind of data standards, technical issues. But then there are also like legal aspects. So fears about what can be done with this data, uh, 
uh, and then skills, uh, et cetera. So, but basically we can cluster them in, in trust. So basically fears about what can be done or commercially done with your data and technical barriers that needs um, to be uh, overcome. And this is a fast moving landscape where new solutions or new partnerships, new collaborations are being piloted, you know, to overcome these kind of challenges, a technical trust, et cetera. And I wanted to bring you today one, uh, one tale, one, one example that I've been following for more than two years right now. It, it's uh, uh, in my research, which is open targets. Basically, uh, and uh, by the way, there are other cases that, I, that I've done also in the health space with, uh, for the Open Science Monitor. But because of time, I'm going to just focus on Open Target. But you can go and maybe if you're interested, you can just mail me and I, I can give you others. Okay. Open Targets uh, is a collaboration of big pharma. So we are talking about highly capitalized companies. So like GSK, Sanger, Takeda, Silgen, uh, Sanofi who partnered with uh, big science infrastructure, EMBL, a BI, which is in Cambridge, in the Welcome Genome uh, Campus. And they uh, agreed to come up together and build a platform in order to run AI, machine learning, and different uh, type of, uh, of tools in order to accelerate drug discovery. And what is interesting is that they broke down the drug discovery process okay, in, in its different phases. So from target identification until the approval of the drug. And then they decided that they would share all their data and their knowledge on targets. They would uh, put it together in order that they could like uh, run different visualizations, different uh, technologies, techniques in order to accelerate drug discovery. So basically this uh, square that I put in red, this is what they agree to do. Yet how they overcome the different technical issues that I was mentioning before. So basically they build a modular infrastructure with different layers for the data that, and with different access rights to the public, to the open targets only at the partners and then privately so that they could do something. Putting different layers help them to um, align the collective and competitive interests that they had. And they did the brokerage exercise. So basically they put an institution in the middle of them in order to agree because how are, I'm gonna trust this other company when I share. So basically they put together like uh, the open targets team which uh, behave as a, an entrepreneurial uh, you know, entrep entrepreneur actor who helped basically to transfer the different data flows from one layer uh, to another. So basically open targets and has had like different res uh, results so far, which are amazing. So different drugs are uh, in the pipeline of those companies to be approved. I mean, you know, uh, and they have also um, developed different repurposing strategies. We have accelerated dramatically the time uh, to market of, of the drugs. And this case has been inspiring uh, for many others as well. I mean, in the sectors, because if pharma which, which we know it's, it, it's, it's very, has been very secretive and very IP oriented, uh, has been able to, to provide this kind of collaborative framework. This can be also inspiring for many other sectors and many other like uh, domains. Yet I want to finish with this uh, question and may, maybe like food for thought for, for our discussion. So, well, I share open targets. I could have shared like a couple of other examples like Yoda or Pistoia that you, could, that you can find where I say, but are those emerging solutions enough, basically? I mean, to grasp the data sharing opportunity that I mentioned and how to scale, how we can scale in order to grasp the potential. Well, thank you very much for your time. And I look forward to the discussion. We cannot hear you, Jose. Sorry, I was muted. The, the idea is that we will do the three presentations and then we will move to a open session for question and answer. So um, I have prepared some questions and probably also from the audience, we will have more questions. Many thanks, Laya, for your fantastic presentation. And now I'm happy to give the floor to Paco Lupiáñez, 
we will be talking about uh, big data and how to move from data to action, really. So- Hello, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Can you see the presentation? So, perfect. perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jose, uh, for the invitation to, to the panel. Um, I'm going to go uh, kind of quick uh, through, through the presentation in order to have then time for, for questions and answers and to go deeper into the discussion. So here, the idea is, is, is basically how we move from, from, from this, all the potential on artificial intelligence and, and, and all the, these billions and billions that are out there and how can, can, how can we get them? How can we make this real? How can we make it uh, happen, okay? So in, in open evidence, uh, we, we work uh, combining or we consider that the, 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 the approach to, to, to capture all this value that was mentioned before by Laya is to combine artificial intelligence and behavior. So algorithms by themselves cannot do the change. What, what, what matters is what can be done with the result of the algorithm. With the results of this analysis, I can produce a new drug. With the results of this analysis, I can produce the, the, a behavioral change in a specific person that is going to be healthier. With the results of these algorithms, I'm going to uh, identify a person falling uh, so I can, I can call an ambulance, okay? So we work in the intersection between the artificial intelligence, what we call the algorithms driven data with the behavioral driven aspect. So individual organizations, how these data analytics, these that descriptions, prediction of prescriptions can be transformed into, into interfaces or scripts that allow us to take the value generated by these uh, algorithms, okay? To do that in health, we go, we need to move from raw data, okay, the rate data that is generated in the electronic health record, the data that is generated in the sensors uh, of the individuals or in sensors on the streets capturing the, the pollution, okay. From there to what we call actionable knowledge, what can be done with this data, what we are doing, what decisions we are taking. And there is a pipeline there. You need to integrate this, this huge amount of data, okay? You need to contextualize this data. It's, it's not the same uh, hospital in Germany than a hospital in Portugal or in Dubai, Dubai, okay, Dubai, okay? And you need to extract these insights and this knowledge to generate an action, okay? Obviously, metadata, data governance, the semantic description, data visualization, and data analytics play a role in all, in all this pipeline. From raw data to, to actionable knowledge. And how, how we, 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 we have been doing that, and we see that other dark actors are, 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 are doing that. As I said before, the prediction is not enough. Having a good algorithm is not enough. This has to be applied with an, within an end user. End user can be a doctor doing a prescription supported by an algorithm. An end user could be a, a, an elderly living at home alone, having a warning because he can, there is fire on the room or, or something like that. So we need to, to apply this actionable knowledge and embed this into, into the behavior. No? When we think about Amazon or Facebook, they are currently doing that. So we need to move from, from the algorithms, from the maps to actions, okay? This is why when producing algorithms, we need to focus on the diagnostics, what we want to do, what we want to analyze. On the data we have available, okay? We have this data or this other data. We can integrate data from primary care and hospital. We can all integrate data from sensors from the patient's home or, or not. So all the data uh, landscape, the models we are doing, okay? And the tools, okay? The tools we are using to produce these algorithms or to give these algorithms to the, to the end user. And again, we need to work on the end user side. We need to, to see how these algorithms are gonna be designed into the end user uh, context. We need to test. 
whether this information caused or not the right reaction from the user. And finally, we need to implement this, okay? By doing that, it's important to, to, to emphasize that we are not talking about magic. We are not talking about, uh, this, is, this is something that I give you A and, 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 and then magic uh, occurs. It's, it's math, it's statistics. It's using steps because at certain point, we are not talking about selling a pair of shoes uh, in Amazon or uh, spreading news on, on Facebook. We are talking about people. We are talking about uh, certain things that other sectors don't, don't have, like patient safety, liability issues. There are several issues on the creation of an algorithm that needs to be taken uh, into account from the requirements of uh, and the problem definition and formulation of, of what we are doing with artificial intelligence, the design, including how we are going to verify and validate what we are doing in a clinical settings, how we are going to produce the, this clinical evaluation, till the monitoring of in real world of how we are doing that, okay? So, uh, unfortunately, uh, the health system is, 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 is not... Uh, another type of system uh, where there are other parameters here, patient safety, cost effectiveness matters as, as, as much as, as, as quality, okay? All this process, and now we move to a couple of examples so that then we, we can discuss, okay? So we need to move from data lab and, and, and infrastructure that Laya was mentioning before, all this, the importance of the infrastructure, okay? to the actionable knowledge, okay? To how this then will happen, how this will transform patient's life or how this will make uh, saving uh, some cost or being cost effectiveness for the health system, okay? We like to work in two scenarios. One is describing things, what is currently happening. Sometimes it's not clear, even though we have the data. To the prediction, so then we, are, we can anticipate what can happen, and then the prescription at the end that still in healthcare, we are a little bit far away, okay? On this, we have built, I put uh, uh, four examples that I'm gonna go across very quick. So on the example of clinical and descriptive, the current technologies, uh, we have been able to pull data from primary care, hospitals, so mixing on, on all this universe of uh, integrated care to build core of patients. This core of patients then could be used to pharma, could be using pharma for developing new drugs, could, could be built also for planning better. So we use uh, uh, to identify BLAM and follow up patient scores more than 500,000 uh, patients were proceeded, the electronic health record Okay, we were able to identify more than 10,000 uh, cancer patients for 15 years of historical data using machine learning and natural language processing techniques. Another example, we were able to, to, to build for the Department de Salud de la Generalitat a, a COVID-19 dashboards in near real time. At the beginning of the pandemic, the information was not codified, okay? And we were able to extract this information from natural, using natural language processing to process all the reports and give information about, okay, do you have COVID, yes or no? And where are you going? What, what is your, that you are going to a, a, a hospital, you are going home, and this will allow healthcare authorities to plan better the, their, under the current pandemic situation. Another three examples from anatom anatomy pathology reports, we were able to extract information again that was useful to better target the, 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 the next steps in the process of the cancer journey, okay? And this information could be used then by the, by the oncologist to better decide which treatment could be applied. Finally, another example that we are very proud is that we were able to predict people not coming to the, to the specialist visits and therefore we were able to decrease the non-attendance in real setting. The algorithm was predicting whether a patient will come or not. And then we worked together with the organization to take the measures 
because we know that people nowadays do not pay attention to the SMS, we reinforce the message to the, to the patient so they attend to the, to, the, to the specialists. And we were able to, to decrease the non-attendance in, in, in 15%. Next one. Some lessons learned on, from the field. Again, uh, we are a, a company, a firm providing services, algorithms as a service. Unfortunately or fortunately, we are not a, a startup for sale. So in our services, we have identified like from both the data analytics and the behavioral perspective from the data analytics. So unfortunately, there is no one magic solution. There is no Dr. Google. There is no one single shot that will solve all the problems in healthcare. So we try to say about, avoid all in one solutions, okay? We are in, in, a, in a place where we have different solutions for different problems and all have to coexist. And then the data governance. Data governance matters because there are many laws on the data that should be respected and it's compulsory. We cannot play with the regulation in this regard, okay? And the behavioral part, we, 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 we learned that it's important to use flexible tools. We cannot impose solutions on end users. It's, it's good to co-create, and I link to the skills and co-creation within the algorithms. So we cannot give you an USB, here it is, here is the solution. It doesn't work like this. And then they should be domain, domain tailored. So natural language processing does not work the same for cancer that for cardiology, okay? The prediction does not work the same for hospital A, B, C, and D. You need to shape to, to, to the domain that you are working, the algorithms that you produce, okay? Thank you very much, and I hope I keep the time, okay? Thank you, Barco, yes. uh, for your outstanding presentation. It's always very interesting to listen to you and all the data you can provide, even in your slides. And also it was very illustrative, the, the example you put on, on how to move from big data to real actionable knowledge. It's, it has been very uh, interesting, really. Thank and, you. Uh, now we have to move to our last speaker, that is uh, uh, Jonathan. Uh, Goldman Raha from the Extremadura region, and he is going to talk about the challenge and opportunities for home care in, Extrema in Extremadura and also put some, some examples on how they are working. So the floor is yours, Jonathan. Thank you, Jose. Uh, let me check if I can put in presentation mode. No, I think. Okay. okay. So, uh, yeah, first of all, thank you very much uh, to Jose and Paula for, for this kind invitation to speak in, in this uh, uh, meeting. So um, I'm working, as Jose said, uh, in the research foundation called Fundes Salud, uh, part of the government of Extremadura. And today I bring um, some, basically some examples of uh, some good practices uh, based on uh, um, digital services and home care uh, based on two different European projects we are participating in. So first I would like to talk about the Extremadura in context, then about the services uh, regarding home care and digitalization we have in Extremadura, and then I will uh, give the two examples I, I bring here. So for those who don't know, Estimadura is a region in the southwest of, of Spain, in the border with Portugal. We are very known because of this uh, small animal, you know, uh, which is the responsible for, for the one of the best thing we have in Spain, which is the Spanish ham. And I really recommend you to, to try this, uh, which is uh, um, very, very famous and delicious. Um, but we also are known because of uh, different things, different uh, uh, products and, and cultural, cultural heritage. But uh, in the other hand, we are a uh, few people in a really huge area, you know, uh, only one million of people, which is basically a neighborhood in Madrid or Barcelona. 
and in a heat, really huge uh, area. And most of the people live in a very uh, low populated um, uh, towns and, and villages. So, and then we have the problem, which is basically uh, all around Europe about, about aging. Uh, around 20% of the population is older than 65 years old. You know, producing the typical problems uh, and putting some pressure to the healthcare uh, system as well. So we have the problem of aging, we have the problem of dispersion in terms of population. So we have to work in different fields. and We were specialized to work in all the um, and collaborate with all different uh, partnership and networks around Europe in this team. Uh, so uh, we are a reference site uh, in the EIP, in the European Innovation Partnership on Active and Healthy Aging. We have three star of the four. Uh, we are part of another different networks like Coral Network or the S3 platform, uh, uh, Smart Specialization platform. And also, uh, we are in the, the board of directors of this association, which is a, a covenant on demographic change, which is promoted also uh, by the European Commission and the World Health uh, Organization. And since we are a few people really uh, living uh, separated each other, so we need to have a really good system uh, we really have to, uh, to have a, a, um, a strategy for digitalization and to uh, provide services remotely uh, instead of uh, you know, uh, forcing uh, the citizens to come to the hospital. So that's why we have a really good uh, healthcare information system, which is integrated, providing integrated medical records, not only the hospitals, the 14 hospitals, also all the primary care and community health centers. So for, for many years, we have a electronic prescription and uh, we have the single medical record. So that means regardless you are in the hospital or in the primary care centers, the health professional can have access to the entire profile. So everything is connected and everything is centralized in, in one single server and one single, single, uh, single system, which is a SAP based uh, system uh, provided by IBM somewhere, several years back in a customized uh, contract. Then we have the interface with the patient, which is basically to, to, basically to manage all the clinical appointments or the, the appointments uh, with the GP, uh, the treatments about pre prescription, also the clinical reports uh, and different things. And the platform is uh, provided in the, all the different devices. Uh, and the last one we implemented was the, the video consulting, the video consultation uh, through the app. So this is the, the typical app and now we are implementing uh, the, the consultation by the phone using by, uh, uh, a teleconference with the GP. So no need to go to the primary care center. Now we, we can do that uh, by, by the phone. And here there are the two uh, different projects uh, I bring. So the first one uh, is the MoveCare project, uh, which is Horizon, Horizon 2020 projects, uh, which basically it's a robotic solution to assist uh, the elders at home. So basically, uh, this uh, robot uh, covers, it's a robot and a platform covers the three different domains, monitoring, assistance, and stimulation. Monitoring about, you know, to, to uh, monitor all the physical activity and cognitive uh, frailty in the, in the elder a system with some functionalities regarding, for example, the call for help in case the, the elder is in a, a, a problem, is in trouble. So uh, she or he can call for help and the robot is assisting, uh, finding less object or suggesting new activities and also stimulation through different uh, games, uh, physical activities as well, and socialization. So as I told you, uh, the, the system is composed by the robot, but also IoT system uh, that uh, uh, 
you know, monitors all the inputs from the user, smart objects, uh, activity center, and a virtual community. Better than speaking, I can put this uh, video, which is in Spanish, but it is a uh, subtitle. Uh, Precisamente él promete ser el cuidador virtual del futuro para personas mayores y dependientes. Se llama Giraffe y después de tres años de investigaciones ya tiene prototipo. En el proyecto participan varios países europeos, pero se está probando aquí en Extremadura con cinco personas mayores. El robot controla, asiste, avisa a familiares y podría aplicarse en telemedicina. No tiene corazón, no tiene alma, pero da tranquilidad, ayuda y acompaña. Ayúdame, por favor. Ayúdame, por favor. No te preocupes, voy a llamar a tu contacto. José, 84 años, vive solo en su piso de Badajoz, pero desde hace dos meses le acompaña a él, Giraf. Es un robot de autómata, fruto de un proyecto europeo, diseñado para mejorar la atención y la autonomía de las personas mayores. De momento se está probando en fase piloto en Extremadura, a través del SEPAP y en la localidad italiana de Milán. Es un acompañamiento al que puedes acudir a pedir ayuda para que comunique ¿eh? a las personas que tú has señalado, tus hijos por ejemplo, yo a mis hijos, de que me ocurre algo, que vengan a casa, que me he caído, que me he mareado, que, que me encuentro con fiebre. Giraf no solo avisa o actúa en caso de emergencia, también controla la salud de su usuario y trabaja con él ejercicios que mantengan su calidad de vida. A través de micrófonos, cámaras y sensores, vigila su peso, calcula sus horas de actividad y reposo, por si se ha podido caer, o detecta su deterioro cognitivo y físico. Hay un bolígrafo, el bolígrafo este que tengo aquí en la mano, que, que me tiene un sensor, unos sensores que controlan con qué fuerza agarro el bolígrafo, si sigo apretando igual al escribir que no. A finales de marzo, cuando acabe esta fase del proyecto, el SEPAD elaborará un informe, con la esperanza de que alguna empresa patente este cuidador virtual y lo comercialice. Otro resultado que puede dar es que eh, cualquier administración pueda usarlo conforme a sus necesidades. No todo, pero sí a mejor parte. De momento lo que ya ha conseguido Giraf es ganarse el cariño de sus cinco probadores extremeños. So, and the uh, other project I bring here, it's uh, called Aquatime, it's an AAL project. Uh, and basically this is a, a smart cup to monitor uh, the hydration that the elder uh, has. So again, another short video and you see the functionalities. Gracias. Uh, I have a question for each speaker and let's try to uh, do it. I, I will try to be very quick and you can do, you can be also very quick because we have uh, 
less than 10 minutes to, to finish. So my first question is to, to Laya and really is related in this uh, pandemia COVID-19 context, um, what do you think is the key challenge uh, for, for data sharing? Uh, and also what is the opportunity in, in this context of COVID-19 for, for data sharing? Uh, what, what do you, you can give your personal opinion as well. Yeah. Thank you so much. So I think, uh, I mean, very spot, I mean, the, the question. So basically what we have seen in the COVID-19 uh, in particular is that pharmaceutical companies have shared in, uh, unprecedentedly uh, data. So they have shared data in order to, um, to leverage their knowledge about COVID-19. And, uh, but in my personal opinion and some conversations that I have had so far with different pharma companies, so from AstraZeneca, uh, GSK and others, the, the pharmaceutical companies are saying that they have done this because it was an emergency, because it was a global crisis, but this is not gonna change the way they behave for other uh, drugs or other diseases. So, um, so I mean, we need just to wait and see what happens, but I think that uh, I don't know if this behavior of more collaboration or more sharing data that we have witnessed in, uh, in COVID can stay for others, for, for mm -hmm. other drugs, or if it's gonna be really like an exception because um, they have treated COVID as a responsibility that they have with society a responsibility that they have with everybody. Let's see. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Laja. And I would like to link my next question also to COVID, uh, because Paco has put an, an example of something, uh, a, a project or, or um, a monitoring uh, analysis that you have done uh, during COVID-19. Can you explain how this has been used and how useful uh, it has been for the for your client. Can you hear me? Yes. Now, I would love to, but <laughs> I think under the current circumstances in in Spain, on the counting of the of the the counting and the monitoring of the pandemic, I think uh, I can't. So I'm so sorry, but uh, I cannot talk about uh, this because uh, I'm not sure what is the use of the things that uh, were developed. And if I see the news on each single uh, region in Spain, I'm afraid that uh, the way we have been using uh, data and technology to monitor the current pandemic situation, it's far away from being ideal. And I guess that this is not related uh, just to technology. So I'm so sorry that I cannot talk about such a sensitive issue. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is a, a surprise really that, in, I think it's not, it's not only Spain, but in many European countries, the data gathering of, of this information around COVID is so slow, so, non-accurate and, uh, and is creating a, a little bit of uh, a stress in population because really we do not know what is happening. So I completely understand. Uh, yeah, I think, I think we are living in, in a world of, uh, of paradoxes yeah. where, where we say, look, we can do wonderful things uh, with uh, this and this technology. And, and at the same time, we have to face the reality that uh, we are probably counting on Excel files, like, like the case of UK, yeah. you remember. So yeah. we need That's to live in, in our current world where the situations are far away from being ideal in the health systems. Uh, and there is a lot of things that can be done and I guess we are in the right path. Mm. Yeah. Completely agree. In, in some cases we have a lot of technology and very sophisticated ways of doing things and then we do with Excel. And uh, my, la my last question really is for Jonathan and, uh, and uh, the idea of um, why Extremadura is so advanced and so forward looking in robotics and artificial intelligence? Why there is this specific 
uh, interest and also in research and innovation? Well, uh, basically, um, the, the interest uh, come from a need and also the capabilities we have. Regarding artificial intelligence, we, as I mentioned before in my presentation, we have a huge amount of data. So because, you know, everything is in the same platform, not only the clinical reports, also the, the uh, human resources, the procurement contracts, uh, and, you know, waiting list, all the ma management uh, uh, behind the healthcare system in the same platform, not only the clinical information. So that means we have huge amount of data to, to exploit. And that's why we are, uh, you know, uh, trying to explore that data. And one thing is, in first, instead of scaling it up uh, in the, for the whole system is to try small pilots and small projects. This is one thing. Regarding yeah. robotics, it's not only robotics, it's more uh, um, care remotely because, mm -hmm. because we are few people in a really dispersed territory. Uh, we need to provide services to the citizen that are you know, two hours uh, from the, the, the closest uh, hospital. So uh, it's not convenient to force the, the citizen to, to come to the hospital and drive for two hours. So we need to, we have many projects and we implemented our telemedicine programs. And one of these is the, the project that we have that is based on the need we have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And have you explored, for example, the possibility of using this draft prototype uh, for people isolated at home during COVID times? Because it is something yes. very... <laughs> This is a good. This is a good question, I and mean, we just uh, have been granted by European Commission with an, with the continuation of this project in the COVID uh, in a COVID nineteen call. So we have another Horizon twenty twenty project for the next two years to only work with the platform. Uh, we avoid the robot because it's really a big. Uh, was it was it was not really user friendly. And we now are exploring all the platform and adapt it to the COVID situation, not only for uh, older people, also for children. Very good. So many thanks uh, again for these uh, answers. Very, very interesting. Do, do you have a question among the speakers for another speaker? If not, we, we can finalize the session. And John, do we have any other question? Hi, Jose. No, at the moment we don't have any other questions in the chat box. Um, okay. Then uh, I just uh, have to say thank you again for participating in this uh, parallel session uh, and uh, have a nice day. And uh, I hope we can collaborate in more uh, scientific and innovation uh, events like this. Many thanks. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Awesome. Bye. 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 Bye.